So for the last two, three weeks, I've been preparing a message to share with you from Isaiah chapter 40. You know, we're making our way through. And I came to Isaiah 40, and there's this fantastic verse that I want to read to you. And it reads like this, Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. It's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. And so I've been preparing this message for the last two or three weeks on, on just this passage. And my, my encouragement will be, has been to, that we read the Bible and, the, and not just read it, but when we read it, we need to realize God is speaking to you. That was my message for this morning. As you read the Bible, God is speaking to you. And then he's also calling you when he speaks to you to do the things that he's telling you. So that was Isaiah 40. That was the message that I had prepared to share this morning until 5 a.m. on Friday. 5 a.m. on Friday, I was laying in bed, and it's still dark outside, and all I could think about was $100,000. We need $100,000 in a month. I'm going to be honest with you. It's one of those nights. I just couldn't sleep because I'm thinking, have I led poorly? Have we made a mistake? Is this all too big for us? We're going to come up short. That's what I felt with just a month to go, and we need $100,000. And I felt overwhelmed. And and, and so at 5 in the morning, I got out of bed, and I did what all of you would have done. I went and made some coffee. Uh, My son had sent me some. It's called Red Tiger from Portland, Oregon. So I made a strong cup of that, and then I got out the, the Bible. And, and I hope that's what you do too when you can't sleep and you feel panicked and afraid and anxious and you're worrying. And so I started to read. Now, for me, my devotional time, I, I read on my iPad. So it was actually my iPad I had. And I turn it on. And I've been reading ahead of us in Isaiah, slowly making my way through the book of Isaiah. And when I turned it on, it was already to the next chapter that I was uh, set to read at. And, it, and so when I turned it on, it turned on to Isaiah chapter 54. Now, for my quiet time on my own, I read from the Message Bible because it feels devotional. And then I turned it on and I started to read. And this is it. So Eugene Peterson, it's a paraphrase, but he titles the different sections in the Bible. He he puts in his own title and he titles this. The first thing I see is spread out, think big. And I'm thinking, no, it's 100,000 and I'm panicking, but I'm going to read Isaiah next. And so I started to read and this this is what I read. Clear lots of ground for your tents. Make your tents large. Spread out. Think big. Use plenty of rope. Drive the tent pegs deep. You're going to need lots of elbow room for your growing family. You're going to take over whole nations. You're going to resettle abandoned cities. Don't be afraid. You're not going to be embarrassed. Don't hold back. And then this was my favorite line. You're not going to come up short. Because the Lord, your maker, is the God of angel armies. Don't you love that? And so I read that, and then I read it again, and it felt really good, and I read it again. And I had all this peace, but as I read it two or three times, as I told you, I'd been preparing this message on how when you read the Bible, God is speaking to you, and then he's just not speaking. He wants you to do it. I felt God clearly was speaking to me, maybe like he's never spoken so clearly to me in my life. And then as a pastor, I think one of our roles, one of our jobs is to share with the people, you, what God is telling us. And I felt like God was saying, share this passage with your people. And so that was Friday. So Friday, we, we pulled all our inserts out of the bulletin. We already had slides for Sunday on Isaiah 40. And I told myself, well, now it's Isaiah 54. And so we're going to, I wanted to spend this morning, I feel like God wants us to spend this morning just looking at these five verses in Isaiah 54. And so turn there with me. And I want to start with this simple, with verse 2. And in verse 2, we read, make your tents large spread out, think big. And so we're going to start with this slide that says, think big, you know, stretch out your tents and think big. That's the first message there. 
I don't know if you watch ABC News, but every Friday on ABC News, they have a person of the week. They name someone a person of the week. And just a few years ago, like maybe four or five years ago, on a Friday, the newscaster came on and said, our person of the week today is Norman Borlaug. <laughs> you go, who is, and, and maybe you're thinking right now, and the rest of America, who is Norman Borlaug? Well, they go on to explain. In 1940, Norman Borlaug, who was a geneticist, he hybridized a corn, and he made it drought-resistant and disease-resistant, and it could grow with very little water in, in arid climates, and he had this, this hybridized corn that he began to grow, in, and then he took samples of it to Africa and to Asia in the early 1940s. And all of a sudden, in the savanna lands of Africa, they could grow rice like a weed. And all over the windswept plains of Asia and South America and Peru, they could grow corn where they've never been able to grow corn before. And so that was 1940. Was it 50 years later? 60, 70 years later, they said, so on this ABC newscast, they said, our person of the week is Norman Borlaug because of the corn that he hybridized. He has now saved, we estimate, more than 2 billion people from starvation. That's one person. That's one grain of corn. And now through that one person, 2 billion people have been saved from starvation. It was because of stories like Norman Borlaug that two and a half years ago, we named our capital campaign for our new building. We called it the Butterfly Effect. Because Andy Andrews, in his book, The Butterfly Effect, it's just a short read, he writes about Norman Borlaug. He also writes about Edward Lorenz. Now, Edward Lorenz was a physicist in, 19, in, the, in the 1960s. In 1963, he had been working on chaos theory, and he wrote a paper on chaos theory. And he came to the New York Academy of Science, the annual gathering in New York in 1963. And he got permission to present his findings, is what you do. And so he presents this paper... And, and his, his name for it was the butterfly effect. And Edward Lorenz said to this gathering of scientists in 1963, some of you have heard this story from me before, but let me tell it again. He said, my theory is, is that, for example, when a butterfly in Africa moves its wings, it puts molecules of air in motion, and everyone agreed with that. And so this, a butterfly flaps its wings, and the air starts to move. He says, my theory I found that that air moves, and in turn, more air moves, and in turn, more air moves because of that, and in turn, more air moves over here because of that until it keeps moving. And then on the other side of the Atlantic, off the coast of Florida, a hurricane will form. That was what he proposed. The New York Academy of Science, all the scientists that began to mock him and ridicule him, and they howled him and booed him out of the auditorium. They said, this is nonsense. It's preposterous. It can happen. And so his, his uh, theory turned into folk legend. No one really believed it until 1993, 40, 30 years later, some Harvard physicist began to take his, his ideas and they studied them closely and they found out that Edward Lorenz was right. He was so right. They said, in fact, this is so true. It's a law of physics. And here's the name of the law. The law of sensitive dependence upon initial conditions. Some of you knew this already. And so you're smart people. But the law of sensitive dependence upon initial conditions. And they've named the butterfly effect a law of physics. And here's the thing. Science has shown that this butterfly effect is true of any first movement including first movements among people. That's why two and a half years ago when we started this capital campaign, we said, your life is like that. This church is like that. If we start a movement here, it's very possible we might change circumstances in Haiti and as far away as Africa and as far away as Thailand. Things might happen from this church, and it's just not they might happen. They're happening. Do you see how that works? That's why we chose the, the language butterfly uh, effect. Your life, my point is, is like that. You see, your life touches another life, and then it touch, and that life touches another life, and then that life touches more lives 
until two, three generations later, the things that you have done with your life now are changing people's lives dozens of years later, not any different than Norman Borlaug's life. That's your life. That's my point. I want you to write down three simple questions. You don't have to, but if you have a pen, write down, because we should be asking ourselves this all the time. When I act, does something important actually happen? That's the first question. Here's another question. Do I, that I is you, do you, do I make a difference in this world? Here's the third question. Do I really matter? Do you really matter? Here's the answer. Yes, yes, and yes on all three of those. The problem is we're taught at a very young age that you come from nothing and you'll return to nothing. But that's a false notion. I want to remind you this morning that you matter. Your life matters. Every single thing you do matters. Even the small things. But tomorrow, every action, every word you speak, it matters because with your life, you are either influencing generations to come or you're harming generations to come, but you don't live neutrally. And here's what we sometimes miss until we read passages like Isaiah 54 where he says, I have plans for you, stretch out, think big, is that our God has this incredible plan and vision and destiny for your life. And sometimes we miss it or we think it's too big. The problem is, is that not... Everyone, not all churches, call their people to think this way. But from the very beginning of this church, we try to help our people see that God had a plan much larger than this street corner for us. I remember my first month as uh, when I got here to Chandler, my first month, every Monday, I would spend all day Monday looking for land because I knew we needed to build. I knew that 85% of churches and schools died. I knew we need to get out of the the school cafeteria that smelled like fish sticks. And so I was looking for land. And when I looked for land, I was only looking at 20-acre parcels. And now I had friends say, Palmer, why are you looking at parcels so big? They said, that's almost, that's, in fact, it'll be more than a million dollars. And I go, I know. And, and then at the time, we only had maybe 100 people, counting every man, woman, and crying child. Uh, we might have had 40 adults at the time. And, and I had people say, Palmer, you can build a church on, t on 10 acres. One person said, you can build a church on five acres. You don't need 20. Well, here's the thing. You could probably build a church on one acre. But I have this feeling in my gut that churches that build on one acre aren't serious about changing the circumstances and the lives of people for eternity on the other side of the world. And so we kept looking for 20 acres until we found this grove, and it felt impossible my point is the way you live today and tomorrow and every day is a reflection of the size of the God that you worship. So think about that with me. The way that you live your life is a reflection of the size of the God that you worship. I think there are some people that attend church that worship very small gods. And we forget that we have this enormous God with incredible limitless abilities, but if you are fearful of something today, I would say your God is too small. If you are anxious about something, then maybe your God is too small. If you're, if you're discouraged about, about life right now, then maybe your God is too small. Here's the thing about great people of faith. When you read about them in the Bible or in history or even today, great people of faith follow this God that is huge. I love hearing great people of, pray, of faith pray. Because great people of, of faith, they pray ridiculous prayers, absurd prayers, improbable prayers. And so that's my invitation to you is to start following that kind of God. And so ask God for a larger tent. Ask God to en enlarge the place of your ministry, to enlarge everything that you're doing for him. I'm going to ask you to write two things down if you have a pen. Two things. And just spend today thinking about it. The first thing is I invite you to write down your goals for life. Write down your goals for the next one year of how you want God to use your life. And then write down your goals for the next five years. What do you dream of God doing with your life over the next five years? And then write down 10. What do you want for God to do in your life, through your life, in the next 10 years? And then second, that was the first thing. The second thing I invite you to write down is write down one thing 
that you know God wants you to do that feels impossible, so big, you could never do it on your own. And I invite you to go home and think about those things. Let's go back to Isaiah 54, and we'll start over. Think big, he says. Use plenty of rope. This is God speaking to Israel and to us. Drive your tent pegs deep. You're going to need lots of elbow room for your growing family. Don't you love the language there? And so I have this thought here. Your family is growing. This family, our family here is growing. And maybe you come at 11 and you don't always see that it's growing. It is. The last service, we could hardly fit everyone in here. And maybe you don't know, for example, during our Sunday morning, we have just first and second grade. We have more than 100 first and second graders. Our zone ministry is just fifth and sixth graders. We have more than 100 fifth and sixth graders. We have more than 100 high schoolers that will meet this morning. Uh, your family is growing. Have you, have you ever been in someone's house and had the feeling like you're not wanted there because there's not enough room for you, because there's not enough space? It happened to me once, just once. When I was in college, a family that lived near us where we went to school invited me and my twin brother over for Thanksgiving dinner. So we accepted, and then I realized that one of my friends whose family lived out of the country had nowhere to go for Thanksgiving. And so I called this lady up and I said, hey, can I bring my poor starving college you know, student friend with me. He has nowhere to go for Thanksgiving. And she said, let, let me just ask you, if I ask you that, hey, can I bring someone with me? What would you, we usually don't talk out loud at the Grove, but I want to hear your answers. What would you say? Yes. yes, by all means, for sure. She says, ooh. She said, no, you can't bring him. She said, I don't have enough chairs to go around the table. I said, what? Hang on. He just one can't hold the pianos. She said, no, there's, there's not enough chairs in my house. Well, your neighbor has chairs. How about the patio furniture? There was no room, she said. And it's a horrible feeling. So we left my, I said, I'll bring you leftovers, buddy. I'm sorry. And so that's what we did. And, but sometimes people come to the Grove and it feels like there's no elbow room or there's no space, as Isaiah says, or there's no space for them. But our family is growing. And, and maybe you haven't noticed, I don't know how you can't help but notice, but when you drive around this area, and I've tried counting, and I got to 20, and I, and I quit counting, but within a five-mile radius of the Grove, there are more than 20 subdivisions, subdivisions under construction. Uh, there's Leighton Lakes. You name the builder, they're here. Mary Kay Homes, Standard Pacific, Ashton Woods. At Bridges, there's five builders alone from Arizona Avenue to Riggs to, you name the street, Lindsay, Val Vista. There's subdivisions going up all around us. Our family is growing. Uh, and we need your help. My point is we need your help to expand our stakes and to build this larger tent that we're working on. Uh, verse 4, and so let's, let's keep reading here. Verse 4, we read this. Do not be afraid. You are not going to be embarrassed. Don't hold back. You're not going to come up short. For your maker is the God of angel armies. I love his language here. Do not be afraid. And so I've written, take courage. Maybe you don't know this, but in the Bible... This is the most repeated phrase in the whole Bible. Don't be afraid. Fear not. 366 times the Bible says, uh, don't be afraid. Take courage. Enlarging your tents, when we read Isaiah's language, is risky business. There was a group of researchers just recently that pulled together people, a room full, um, several dozen people that were 95 years old or older. And they wanted to learn from them. And so they asked them one question. This room filled with people over 95, so picture that. And they asked them this question. If you could do it all over again, so they're at the end of their life, if you could do it all over again, what would you do differently? So their whole, if you could do it all over. Their number one, overwhelming number one response was, could you repeat the question louder? <laughs> yeah, that, that's what, that was the number one answer. Okay. All right. I just made that up. Let's Their number one answer was, if I could do it all over again, I would slow down, soak in more sunsets, 
and eat more ice cream. That's what they said. The old people all said that. And that's awesome. And so permission to eat more ice cream. But I'm getting to their second answer. Their second answer from all of these people over 95 years old, they said this, I would take more risk. They, they knew that you can't do the greatest things in life without taking risk. And we live in this risk-adverse society. And, and the greatest thing that God wants to do, things that God wants to do with your life, they will include risk. I love their third answer. Number three was, I would have given my life to something that would last. Something they said that would outlast my own life. And I want to tell you right now, if you give yourself to building larger tents, to expanding what you're doing for Jesus Christ with your life, it will, it will last for eternity, but it will, it will affect the next generation, your children, and then your children's children. You can have that influence on their lives right now. So God says, take courage. And he says, verse 54, do not be afraid. I think sometimes we are afraid that God won't be there, that we'll be embarrassed or we'll come up short or we'll lay in bed at five in the morning going, $100,000, we're all going to die. You know, that, those were my thoughts. But if God has spoken, he says, uh, we he says, I'll be there for you. I think sometimes Christians say things like, well, if God were to speak to me, then I would do it. And I want to say, he's already spoken. He said, enlarge your, the place of your tent. I hear Christians sometimes say, well, well, Satan is attacking me. That's why nothing is working out. And I want to ask you this. Are you really doing the things with your life that would cause Satan to be angry? I hope you are, but most of us aren't. Fear is this internal alarm that disrupts our faith and it freezes us. I made this list of big, we'll call people that live the way Isaiah is calling us to, big tent people. Big tent people believe God will use their life, your life, in spite of your inadequacies. Big tent people know that courage is not the absence of fear. Fear will be there, but we still move ahead. Three, big tent people will realize you cannot succeed without the risk of failure. That failure is, yes, it's always a possibility, but it's, part, it's a part of doing the risk of it, is a part of doing the great things for God. And so today, if uh, your marriage is sinking, then take courage, don't give up. If, you're, if raising your kids has gotten too tough and overwhelming, then take courage and don't give up. If you feel overwhelmed at work and you want to quit, then I say take courage and don't give up. If there's anything that you know God has called you to do, but you think you might fail, I say today take courage and don't give up. If we keep reading, we get to verse 4, and he invites us, the, the writer, through, and God speaking through Isaiah, invites us to participate with God. And we read this in verse 4. He says, don't hold back. I just want to read that short phrase, don't hold back. Because sometimes, even people that sit in this church, I feel like some people at some times, we hold back. We hold back from giving our best. We hold back from giving. We hold back from participating. In uh, Genesis chapter 13, I'm, I'm reaching back to God speaking to Abraham. He says, there's some land that I want to give you. He says, look, north, east, west, south. He said, it's all yours, but, but you have to participate with me. You have to go walk it. You have to get up and go walk around it, and then I'll give it to you. That's, that's your only rule. It's to go get up and walk the length and the breadth. This is verse 17. Go walk the length and breadth of the land that I'm going to give you. Verse 18, so Abram moved his camp to Hebron and settled near, I'm not making this up, near the grove. That's where he was. And there he built an altar to the Lord. So he builds his place of worship in the grove. Here's how that reads in the Message Bible, uh, Genesis 13, 17. We read, so on your feet, get moving. And I say, as Isaiah says, don't hold back. The word that I've chosen here is the word participate. And my invitation to you is to participate with God in what he's doing here. That's always been our challenge at the Grove. There's some churches that are okay with people coming to church and spectating. 
But at the Grove, we've always said, no, we want participants, whether it's in a worship service or whether it's, it's becoming modern-day abolitionist in Thailand, we want you to participate in all of those things. And here's the thing. There's, a, there's an enormous difference between spectators and participants. I'll use this rope as an example. So there's a tightrope rope artist in, 19, in 1940 who lived in Paris. And he was walking across everything. He was stringing up rope between buildings and walking across it. And, and now I know this story is true because I read it on the internet. So, so just bear with me. You can, you can check for yourself. It's on the internet. I, I, don't, I don't know how true it is, but it's what I read. So he's, he's doing all this in Paris. And then a promoter in New York hears about him. He says, hey, come over to New York. I want you to walk across the Niagara Falls. And so this tightrope walker says, well, that's a long way. I'll need a lot of money. So he gives him the price. The promoter says, that's way too much. He says, well, I'm only coming if you pay me. And finally, the promoter says, okay, if you can really do it, if you can really walk across Niagara Falls, I'll pay you the money. But if you don't walk across and back, I'm not paying you the money. So the guy comes. They stretch a rope across Niagara Falls. Read it on the Internet. And then uh, he walks across, and he comes back. And then just to prove how good he is, he gets a wheelbarrow, and he walks across with a wheelbarrow and back. And then he, he, when he got back, he, he looked at the promoter. He says, now do you believe I can make it there and back? And promoter said, sure, I just watched you. And the tightrope walker said, okay, now get in the wheelbarrow. He said, let's do this again. You know, let's go across now. And you see, there's a big difference between standing on the shores of Niagara Falls and watching the wheelbarrow go. It's another thing to get in there and participate and be a part of it. But at the Grove, that's what we're at. We're asking you to get in the wheelbarrow and not just watch. I want to say that this growing family is your growing family. The needs of this church are not someone else's needs. There, there are needs together. Sometimes I and our leaders feel like we're carrying the load of the need of this church by ourselves. And I was reminded on Friday as I read this passage that this is all of our need to carry together. And then I'll just end with this one line, verse 5, where we read, first verse 4, don't be afraid, don't hold back, verse 5, for your God is the God of, for your maker, is the God of angel armies. And, and if your God is on your side, then, then everything is possible. Everything is doable. And sometimes we f- forget that. Uh, Josh and his team are going to come up, and they're going to lead us in this song, God of, I forget how it goes, but it says something to the effect that the God of angel armies is right here by your side. And while we do that song, I want to invite you to do this. I want to invite you, if you would, to fill out this card. And, and if you would, as an individual, as a couple, as a family, come and put this card here. And um, our need is 100000 I'm going to tell, can I tell you what happened in the last two services? The first service, and it's not very many people, they gave... This is a chart. We've never done one of these before. They gave $19,000, and then I told you our need was 100. The next service gave us 72,000. We topped 100 in two services. Can we give a hand to the church at the, at the Grove? I mean, that's unbelievable. But I do, but so I'm not going to say stay in your chairs though, because. Uh, Josh, we have a lot of needs moving into this building. We still have not purchased half of our sound equipment yet. So we need your help over these next five weeks. Could I invite you, as I said before, to fill this card out? And I'm going to, and then drop it in the bucket here of what you can do. I told the last service, I said, if there's a hundred people at the Grove, a hundred families or individuals or couples that can give a thousand dollars, over five weeks, it's $200, $200 a week, that we, we meet the goal. And so maybe you can do that. Maybe you can't quite do that. Um, and that's okay because there's some of you that can give more than that. Then, then give more than that. But whatever you can give, give that. We need everyone here to participate. So Veronica and I will start, my wife and I will start, and, and I'm going to drop this here, and I, I invite you to join us. 
And then I invite you to take a piece of rope. Uh, we bought all the brown rope Home Depot has, so we went back and bought white rope. We ran out after the second service. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take Isaiah's metaphor of, it, of stretch out your ropes, and we want to chain these together, daisy chain them, tie them together, and connect this, this, uh, this stage all the way with the middle of the room in our new building. So but it's going to take all of us uh, being a part of that. So I'm going to start here. I'm going to tie this here. And then add yours. We're going to go out the building and head left. And you can keep going all the way into the building. All right. So go ahead and stand and uh, participate with us as we do this together. 